All right, if you would this morning, turn with me to uh, Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. We've just completed uh, last week a study on uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we looked at the benefit of Scripture, uh, talking about doctrine, correction, uh, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. And so I thought it would be fit to start in the Old Testament just to show you that we do believe all Scripture. And uh, I want to talk to you today about, in some way, what you might consider a depression, depressing type message, but uh, the reality of where we are today in the world in which we live. I think we all would agree that this country is in a mess. The world in general is in pretty bad shape. And people, when that happens, they want to point fingers at one political party or another. And that's not to say that that's not part of it. But the fact is, is that we're there's an underlying problem. There's an underlying reason. And I believe it starts with mankind. And because man, after all, brings about these problems. Uh, whether it's across the, the globe or right here at home. And sometimes we feel like that old song on Hee Haw that was sung years ago. I don't know if any of y'all ever watched Hee Haw. But uh, when it was on at 6 o'clock on Saturday night, I was going to be in my recliner in front of the TV because I just loved the program as corny as it was. But all through the program, these two guys would pop up out of the cornfield and they'd sing a, a little song. And one of them was gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Probably the only poem I ever learned. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you think about life in general, we all come to a point at times when the emotions get the best of us. And we find ourselves feeling sorry for ourselves. And one of the remedies for that, I think, is to always look around and see how many people are in much worse condition than we are or you are. Not that that always helps, but the fact is that it is true in, in most instances, but not always. But in Psalms chapter 8, the psalmist writes there in verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. In all the earth thou hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast tamed, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. I was reading this passage this week, one morning, and my imagination kind of runs wild sometimes when I read scriptures like verse 3. When I consider thy heavens. In other words, the, the idea here is, what is, he says, what is man? You, you think about God Almighty creating the heavens. And he says, the work of thy fingers. Making it a very, uh, uh, making a, a picture that we can all associate with. <laughs> I don't know why I have these thoughts, but. I'm thinking about God sitting there and he just thinks about the moon and the sun and the stars and with his 
He, he, he forms these things. And I, I can just picture God up there with these big old fingers creating a mosquito. <laughs> and wondering why. <laughs> why? He forgot to throw away. He should have done that <laughs> with the mosquitoes. But he asked the question, what is man? In other words, in comparison with all the heavens and the work of thy fingers and the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast madest him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Well, the problem is, is that glory and that honor did not last. Look back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, which is, compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is... Uh, Bellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Ion, the same as it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. By the way, for that guy that wrote the thing about the Garden of Eden was somewhere in the mountains of Georgia. Uh, you can forget that, unless you can find the river up there. The name of the third river, and he lists that. Let me just skip down. The Lord God took the man, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, and I'll make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Uh, look down at verse 21. And the Lord God raised, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. By the way, verse 24 is the only verse in your Bible that's in the Old Testament quoted by Christ and by Paul. So it's very significant. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And the next three words really say it all. Now the serpent. <laughs> now the serpent. God, I believe, listen folks, I believe every word of the book of Genesis. I don't believe it's any kind of uh, uh, fable or symbolism or whatever. I believe God did exactly what he said he did in this book. Amen. In creation. In creating man. And the psalmist says, What is man that they are mindful of him? Thou makest him to have, he said, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. <clears throat> and so we see man before the fall in a state of perfection 
And yet God gave that man and that woman a free will. The ability to make a choice. And they made the wrong choice. And from that day forward, most of the choices of lost mankind have been bad. They've been destructive. They've been hurtful. And because that we today live in a world that is under a sin curse, if you will. Amen. Now, if you go back to Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So there's a picture there of creation. There's a picture there of God's desire for mankind. And yet, right here in this same book, if you look over in Psalms, chapter 51, notice the difference in thought in Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, where the psalmist says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, what happened to the glory and the honor and all the dominion and so forth? He said, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin, in sin did my mother conceive me. Look down over in chapter 53, in Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. And notice the indictment upon man. Every one of them is gone back. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. There were they in great fear where no fear was, for God hath scattered the bones of him that encamped against thee, that has put them to shame, because God has despised them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when God bringeth back the captivity of his people, and Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. You see, Israel rejoiced in the hope of God, in effect, reversing the curse that had been placed upon the earth when he saved, or he called out Abraham and told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your seed. And your seed will be as the stars of the sky or as the sand upon the shore and, and so forth and gave them numerous promises which by the way will be fulfilled uh, the, one, the promises concerning Israel uh, someday they will be fulfilled they will get what God promised them but the fact is is that like mankind throughout the Bible, you have Adam and Eve. You get over to Genesis chapter 6, and God saw the imaginations of man that they were only evil continually, and so he destroyed the earth with a flood, save Adam and his family. And then we find in choosing the nation Israel, giving them the law, and they fail miserably. And so... The fact is, is that no matter what program God puts man under, man is a failure. Amen. He's an absolute failure. And it's all because of sin. 
Jeremiah chapter 17, very familiar passage, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Jeremiah said in chapter 16, You have done worse than your fathers. For behold, you walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Look, if you will, over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 18. And he saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from with, whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all means, all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. Now notice where it comes from. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within and defile the man. You know, sometimes I think we get kind of callous to the evil that is in this world. The evil that's in this nation. And we think in our heart and mind, how is it people could be so evil? Well, that shouldn't really be the question. The question should be, if you ever see anybody doing something good, is where did that come from? <laughs> and we know that God Almighty desires for us to do good. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus into good works. But our sinful nature goes against everything that God has ordained in relation to the church, the body of Christ. And it starts with the very means by which we get into the body of Christ. Evil hearts. Talking about the article that Jerry wrote, and I was thinking about this as I was putting together these ideas about what I want to talk about this morning. And I think about the church, the body of Christ, as a body. And then all those outside of it. You've got, first of all, those that are religious and yet lost. And you look at them and a lot of those people are good, moral, upstanding individuals. And yet they're outside of the kingdom of God because they've not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are believing in a work salvation. And then you go outside of that and you've got society in general and you've got probably a majority of those people that are what we would refer to as good people in the sense of they are honest, they do things that are good, they support charitable organizations. You can go right on down the list. Maybe they don't even believe in God, but they believe in helping their fellow man. And then you've got that next circle as it moves out that are just plain evil that their desire is to do evil and do wrong. And I know people say, well, a lot of that comes from mental illness, and certainly it does. But folks, listen, when you look at our world as it is and our society, and you think about, and I hate to, I don't want to get political, but you think about the, the school shootings and the uh, mass shootings and all of that kind of stuff and the corruptness of the world in general. 
You know where it all starts? It starts with the heart of man. Amen. With the heart of man. That is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And you see, the problem is, is that the world tries to address the issues, the social issues, through changing man. And some people may change, but the fact is, is there's only one real change that will bring about any real lasting result. And that is for people to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, become a new creature in Christ. Now I want you to look over in Romans, in Romans chapter 1. Now, you know, when you talk to people about the gospel, when you witness to people, generally you're talking to people that in their heart and their mind, they think they're pretty good and they might be compared to the world standard. But the fact is, is that the Bible declares them as unrighteous as the person that walks in a building and shoots everybody in there. There's not any big sin and little sin with the Lord. Now, there's sins that have greater consequence in our world today. But notice what Paul said about, right after he talks about the gospel being the power of God and the salvation, Romans 1.16, in verse 17, we dwelt on last week, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which, they may, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, as in Genesis chapter 6. The imaginations of man were only evil continually. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed, who's the fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And he changed the glory, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, no doubt a reference to idolatry. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, through dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, <laughs> wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, <clears throat> haters of God, deceitful, proud, 
boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who know in the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now that is not a pretty picture, is it? I mean, that just summarizes the whole thing. And yet today, religion has made people somehow believe that they don't fall into that category of a sinful individual, that they somehow can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and be acceptable to God and somehow work their way into heaven. And there are certain things that need to be acknowledged. Number one, all men are sinners. All. Paul said in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You didn't become a sinner when you committed your first sin. You were born in sin. And sin did his mother conceive me. He said, one, by one man sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. That means apart from salvation, there is no hope of life beyond this life. You think it's miserable now? As the old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, there's nothing on this earth, in my thinking, that could duplicate the sorrow and the terror of stepping into eternity as a lost individual. Amen. And while we should do everything that we can to make a better government, better surroundings and so forth, the only real answer is for men to have a changed heart. Amen. And that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back, if you will, to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verse 9, Paul said, What then are we better than they? Referencing, no doubt, the Jew versus the Gentile, knowing no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. You see, that's what infuriated the Jewish people that Paul left to. He just throws them right into the same category as sinful Gentiles. Well, they believed they were God's people. They had a free pass into eternity. That one day God was going to establish a kingdom upon this earth and they are going to be part of it. And John addressed that in Matthew chapter 3. He said, do you think because you're the children of Abraham that you have a place in this kingdom? He said, God's able these stones to raise up children of Abraham. He said, to repent of that very thought. And so Paul is addressing there, he says, we've, we've before proved by the things that he's shown. We've before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. Notice the next verse. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Last week we talked about the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of God to every believer. But apart from that, there is none righteous. No, not one. And Israel, Paul said in Romans 10, they were ignorant of God's righteousness and were therefore going about to establish their own righteousness by keeping the law and so forth. But Paul says, as it is written, and we just read where it was written in Psalm 53, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. We were all born in the sinful likeness of Adam. 
And because of that, there is not one of us who are righteous. Look in chapter 3, verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Say, so, well, I, knew, I know people that do good. They might do good deeds, but there is none that doeth good to the extent that that goodness will bring about salvation. In Romans chapter 3, verse 13, Paul says their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. According to this, we see that all men are liars, cursers, killers, destroyers, all men are sinful. And yet, when you talk to a religious person, they have a very difficult time placing themselves on the same ground as sinners. I've mentioned several times about a man who attended here with Brother Larry Hogue when they first heard us on the radio. Larry accepted immediately the message the truth of the gospel but this fellow that came with him he was a, a more intellectual type what he really was was a Calvinist and I mentioned one Sunday morning in talking about the sinfulness of man and the grace of God how that even a man like Hitler if Hitler had have on his deathbed seen and understood that Christ died for his sins and accepted him as his Savior, that Hitler would go to heaven based on his faith in Jesus Christ. That infuriated that man. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, Brother Steve, surely, surely you misspoke. You don't, you don't believe that, do you? I said, absolutely I believe that. He said, a man as sinful as that? And I looked that man straight in the eye and I said, let me ask you something. Is your sin nature really any different than his sin nature? You understand nature? He said, well, certainly. I would never do those things. You see... Until a person's willing to identify themselves with the lowest of sinners, they don't really see a need for a Savior. They figure they can do it on their own or, or like him, that God chose him before the foundation of the world. Now he's just, you know, waiting to, he, he had to wait until he found out he was one of the chosen and now he's chosen and now, you know, he's going to go about living for the Lord the best he can and face a general judgment and all that kind of stuff. Folks, there's none righteous. No, not one. Mankind, the majority of those that you meet are lost. Years ago, Brother Moore preached here one night during a Bible conference. And he asked a question. He was preaching along the very same lines I am, out of Romans chapter 3. I remember it vividly. And at the end of that message, he asked this question. <clears throat> he said, do you believe that there are people in this world that you are better than? And afterwards, this lady went up to him and said, absolutely, I know there are people in this world that I'm better than. Brother Moore told me about it after the service or after everybody was gone. Three weeks later, that lady got saved. Hmm. You see, folks, salvation, I believe, requires a need, Maybe. an understanding of a need. You see, what religion's done is, is taught people that if you'll be good, and after all, 
By the way, when you compare yourself to a school shooter or an adulterer or a drug dealer or an addict or whatever, I mean, when the people, the religious people of this world compare themselves to those people, how do they match up? They look pretty good, don't they? In the flesh. And so what the devil has done, he's convinced those people that your goodness is a value. And if you'll be good, God will save you. And folks, that's not, that's not the real issue. The issue is all have sinned. Your goodness is of, all, of no value for God Almighty unless you are saved. And so Paul goes on to say, we're liars, cheaters, thieves. He said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, our bodies are vile. Now turn over to the book of Ephesians. I'm going to have to cut out some of these notes. See, Jerry doesn't have notes, so he don't have to worry about <laughs> skipping to the end. He knows when to end. I don't. Uh, I, I do because I have it on paper, but that's the only way I do. Uh, now, seriously, I think about the Ephesians. Ephesians were not nice people. Matter of fact, when you look at Ephesians and Colossians, you're looking at two groups of people that are just like us. Amen. Just like us. They were idol worshipers. They were worshiping in the temple of Diana. And yet when Paul writes to them in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And notice the next phrase. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. While the Apostle Paul, who said, as touching the law, blameless, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, puts himself right on the same plane with those lost Ephesians when he said, among also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh. Paul's lust of his flesh may not have been to do the same things as the Ephesians were, but him when he is having people put to death, that was because of the lust of his flesh. His religion. What he perceived to be a work for God. That's what the churches are filled up with today. People that believe that because they're doing God's work, somehow God's going to accept that as payment for their sinful condition. And yet in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says, In whom we, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. While Paul knew that the Based on what he had done, he was worthy of death the moment he saw the Lord there from heaven. He was a blasphemer. And he says, we have redemption through his blood. And so it's through the Lord Jesus Christ that we are redeemed. It's through the faith of Jesus Christ that we are justified. It is by his faith that we're made righteous. It is by His death all of our sins were paid for and therefore were forgiven. And it's by His resurrection according to Romans chapter 4 He was raised again for our justification. You see folks as evil and bad as the world is we that are saved have nothing to glory in save the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we can say with the Apostle Paul, by the great, only, only by the grace of God, I am what I am. But we should understand and see the need for the ministry that God has set before us as ambassadors for Christ 
because man cannot save himself. He can't get good enough. He can't get religious enough. And so it is our responsibility to preach the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, and testify to the saving power of Jesus Christ. That's the real hope for this world. Amen. And as far as you and I are concerned, the Apostle Paul said, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Even we are in the same category. You see, God has not exempted us. I mean, when you pull into the service station tomorrow, I tell you what, you go in there and say, listen, you need to understand, I can't pay $4.59 for gas. I'm saved. I want a discount. See how far that gets you. You go to the grocery store, tell them you want the Christian discount of 50%. No. They might just jack it up on you. You see, the benefit we have, folks, and thank God for it, is the peace of God that passes all understanding. That will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that no matter how bad things get in this world, this isn't our home. We're just passing through. And I know for you young people, that's not a lot of comfort sometimes. You say, that's easy to say for a 75-year-old man. I mean, you got one foot on the banana peel now, and, <laughs> and you, you could go any day. Almost did last Tuesday. The fact is, even if you're a young person, even more so if you're a young person, you need to know where your hope is. And it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And rest in Him. And know that the things of this world, they might try to destroy you and destroy your flesh, but you've got hope beyond this life. And you've got hope here because you've got hope in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I hope you would acknowledge the things that are said here about mankind. Psalm said, What is man that's our mindful of him? Now crown us to him with glory and honor. But he lost that glory and that honor when he sinned. And now he is a sinful being. All has sin comes from the glory of God. But the good news is, when Christ hung on that cross, God placed all your sins upon Him. Amen. And He died for them. And He was buried and raised again the third day. Believe that, trust that, and God will save you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. We thank You for the instruction of it. We thank You for the power of it. And we thank You, Lord, for the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection, and that we are saved, and that we, our trust is not in this world. And we just pray, Lord, that you would give us faith to put our trust in you. And Lord, we understand that this world is sinful and bad, but you have given us hope that this world cannot provide. And you've given us hope of life beyond this life. And we thank you for that. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here this morning. We're dismissed. <laughs>